Thank you very much. And good morning, Mr. Speaker. Good morning to colleagues in the House. I'd like to begin by congratulating my colleague on his recent appointment as Minister of Natural Resources. Uh, I know that he brings to it uh, a thoughtfulness and sincerity, and he will be a pleasure, I think, to work with going forward. This is an important bill because it deals and treats with important issues that sometimes is difficult for average working Canadians to understand, Mr. Speaker. So I think it's important for us to, to keep it simple. And in my remarks this morning, I'm going to try to explain to Canadians why this is so very important uh, in the architecture of energy uh, for Canada going forward, a theme I'm going to return to in a few moments. First of all, we know that this bill is going to update the safety and security regimes for Canada's offshore and nuclear energy industries. How will it do that? It's going to expressly include the polluter pays principle. Uh, a notion uh, perfected in the 1980s and now increasingly finding implementation in Canada and around the world, the notion that uh, the entity that generates the pollution is responsible for its cleanup and responsible for its liability as a result of the pollution. So that's an important and I think positive thing to be including in the bill. It also increases liability limits to a billion dollars. And it does so without proof of fault or negligence, or as we say in the legal profession, strict liability. The polluter will be held strictly liable for whatever occurs on their watch with respect to pollution of that kind. That's a very big step for Canada to be taking uh, Mr. Speaker, and one that we should be exploring and we will be exploring, I know, in greater detail in committee. Part one amends the offshore petroleum regime. That's the exploitation of oil and gas off Canadian soil in our waterways, and it will try to enhance incident prevention. It'll try to enhance our response capacity to problems and, of course, liability and compensation. It will primarily update and strengthen the liability regime that is applicable to spills and debris in offshore areas. Now, this is very important, uh, Mr. Speaker. This question of response capacity and incident prevention, we now know, is extraordinarily important. We've seen two recent examples in the last several decades that have, frankly, really focus the minds of Canadians who watch it and citizens all over the world who are very concerned. One, of course, was the terrible tragedy of the Exxon Valdez and how that occurred and the remedies that flowed from that major oil spill along the, the coast of Alaska, the effects of which are still being felt, the cleanup for which is still being executed. And, of course, there have been learnings as our American friends like to say, there have been learnings, things that we have learned from that tragedy that have led to improvement. For example, the use, the widespread use of double-hulled shipping for oil and petroleum products going forward. The second more recent incident, Mr. Speaker, is this terrible, terrible spill in the Gulf of Mexico uh, with the BP wellhead. Now, for Canadians who are watching or reading, this was so significant that we now know that with prosecutions, with fines, with settlements, with compensation, the costs for the Gulf of Mexico incident are now well over $42 billion and counting. Uh, this is a very, very, very significant amount of money for the corporation involved. There are long-term effects. There are long-term human effects, long-term economic effects, and I would argue perhaps longer-term ecological effects. And we're entering into uncharted territories, territory, Mr. Speaker, in many regards here, because we don't always know. We don't always know. The science isn't always there to confirm just how long-term, indeed, that ecological damage is. So it is important for us to go to committee 
and to examine this question of response capacity and incident prevention. It does, however, raise the question about why it is the Conservative government has rushed through Beaufort Sea exploration licenses in full knowledge, having been asked, having been forewarned, both by industry and by third parties, raised on the floor of this House, raised in committee repeatedly, Mr. Speaker, why is it, in full knowledge of the fact that we do not have the technology to deal with a spill in the Beaufort, why has the government rushed these licenses through? The Arctic Ocean is a very, very shallow ocean. It's also an extremely rough body of water. And there is no known booming system, for example, Mr. Speaker, to contain an oil spill should it occur during this phase of exploration and ultimately exploitation. So I don't know why the government is allowing the licenses to go forward and fast-tracking fast them several years ago, and now, several years later, trying to take corrective action to enhance response capacity. We'll have to look at that at the committee. Particularly, as I say, there is no known response capacity for a spill in those waters. The second thing this bill does in part two is it amends the nuclear regime, the way in which we oversee our nuclear energy sector. It establishes greater legal certainty, it enhances liability and compensation in the event of a nuclear accident. Many speakers here have raised the spectrum of a nuclear accident. Uh, of course, this is very worrisome. Of course, this is something that we need to learn from internationally. It, it provides, the bill provides for the establishment in certain circumstances of an administrative tribunal to hear and decide claims and, of course, implements certain provisions of an international treaty, the Convention of Supplementary Compensation for Nuclear Damage. Now, here I'd like to stop for a few moments, Mr. Speaker, and speak about this question of our nuclear regime in Canada. What has been happening around nuclear power in Canada over the last eight years since the arrival of the Conservative government? Well, for about 57 years, Mr. Speaker, Canada led the world through Atomic Energy of Canada Limited in the production of nuclear power capacity the exportation of that capacity, the physics under, underpinning that uh, technology, a world leader, not only in the generation of power, but also, of course, linked to it in the production of medical isotopes. This is extremely important going forward, Mr. Speaker, and this bill will have a bearing. There was a time when Canada was supplying 65% of all of the medical isotopes in the United States, as well, of course, as furnishing our own medical isotopes here in Canada and exporting widely around the world. Why is that important? Why is that so important, Mr. Speaker? Because medical experts tell us that the future of medicine is in what is called, what they call, personalized medicine. And personalized medicine is going to require the use the significant expanded use of nuclear medicine, without which we will not be able to take our medicine, take our treatment as human beings to the next iteration, the next level. So isotope production is going to be critical for Canadians. It's also going to be crit critical, Mr. Speaker, for the rest of the world. As China becomes more affluent, as India becomes more affluent, as other parts of the world become more affluent, there's no doubt in our collective minds, I'm sure, that those parts of the world are going to require also greater access to nuclear medicine. So what has Canada done with that opportunity and that knowledge in front of it? Well, several years ago, the Prime Minister's Director of Communications, in a well-orchestrated rollout with respect to the future of Atomic Energy of Canada Limited, the same individual who now heads up Sun TV, for Mr. Pelado, the a separatist owner of, of a major news network. It's, it's interesting, Mr. Speaker, as an aside, I'd love to hear from the Sun journalists who for years have been attacking um, all sorts of different folks with respect to their views. But I haven't, I, haven't, I haven't seen a single commentary yet from these leaders of the Sun regime on the majority shareholder of their corporation. Just a small aside. This is a small aside.
But we had that same person, the former Director of Communications, come out in the hall here and run down the asset, run down atomic energy of Can Limited. I remember the words, I remember the day, Mr. Speaker, because I was so absolutely stunned by them, when he came out and said that atomic energy of Canada is a $12 billion sinkhole. A $12 billion sinkhole. And that was, of course, deliberate because it's a strategy used by the Conservatives to run down a state-owned asset that, which they would, would want to dispose of. And, of course, lo and behold, the vast majority of AECL was dumped on a fireside sale at $100 million to SNC-Lavalin Montreal, thereby com compromising Canada's future, in my view, with respect to nuclear power plants going forward, with respect to the production of medical isotopes, and, of course, obtaining a certain share of that marketplace. Today, Mr. Speaker, as we speak, there are over 120 requests for proposals being considered worldwide for new nuclear power plant installations. That's the reality. Now, is Canada prepared? Is AECL actively bidding? Are we ready to conquer some of those markets? I would say no. When you dispatch the Prime Minister's Director of Communications to describe your state-owned en nuclear energy company as a $12 billion sinkhole, Furthermore, as I just put to my colleague from the NDP, Mr. Speaker, we'll have to look at committee, in my view, on the energy mix going forward. How will nuclear power fit with renewable power and fit with other forms of power? For example, geothermal, in my view, an energy source that we've barely begun to tap, particularly in a northern Canadian context, where it's highly economic. It's economic to be using geothermal, Mr. Speaker, in our north. But we're not investing very much at all, in my view. And here I would agree with my NDP colleague. We are not putting the resources we need, in my view, in public research and development in our energy future, however that mix is going to be comprised. And finally, Mr. Speaker, on the nuclear regime side, it's important for all members to understand that very unfortunately, very unfortunately, given the global consumption of water, 70% of the world's fresh water is used today in agricultural production. It is the same statistic in the United States. And as American northeastern cities drop in population, and as the United States builds ever-increasing larger cities in its dry southwest, we will see even more pressure on fresh water, Mr. Speaker, which, of course, is giving rise to all kinds of new economic opportunities, unfortunately, I say, in the desalination of water. And the only form of energy which is economic in desalination we know thus far is nuclear. Are we going to tell the world, are we going to tell the world that they can't have access to water? I don't think so, Mr. Speaker. Not given the pressures that we know that are coming, and of course not, not knowing what we know now about climate change. We'll come to climate change and an energy discussion in a second. So, it's very important for us to examine this question of the nuclear regime in a broader context. This is not just a technical amendment bill, but it has to be examined in that context of both the Canadian situation and the international markets, which, uh, which I alluded to just a moment ago. For example, we know the in the nuclear sector the liability cap is going to go from $75 million to $1 billion. That's a very significant jump. This brings Canada in line with the promises that it made when we did sign the International Convention on Supplementary Compensation for Nuclear Damage in December 2013. So in a sense, we are simply moving to ratify that which we signed on an international level. In the offshore oil and gas sector, the absolute liability for companies operating in the Atlantic offshore will increase from $30 million to $1 billion and in the Arctic from $40 million to $1 billion. And operators will have to have $100 million specifically earmarked for spill response. That's a quantum, that's a number, Mr. Speaker, that I think deserves to be examined much, much more closely. $100 million earmarked for spill response if, as I said earlier with respect to the Beaufort, if that technology actually exists, which we know in that context it does not, but if the technology exists for spill response to deal with it, $100 million? $100 million when the BP spill in the Gulf of Mexico 
Is $42 billion and counting? I don't think that's a serious number, Mr. Speaker. It's something we're going to have to hear from experts on in terms of the satisfact satisfactory uh, li uh, protection uh, linked, of course, to the insurability of, these of some of these actions and whether or not there is insurance to be drawn down on top of the $100 million specifically earmarked. Other questions, Mr. Speaker, that have to be asked and probed. It ra this legislation raises several issues. For example, is this bill going to make it way more expensive for offshore energy companies to operate off the Atlantic and Arctic coasts by raising their financial liability, by forcing them to have more money on hand, by increasing the funds they must have on hand for disaster response specifically? Okay. How much will it increase the cost by? What do the corporations have to say about that? I think it's important for us to hear that. Is a billion dollars adequate in the Arctic, where environmental conditions make spill response efforts very challenging? Really, a billion dollars, Mr. Speaker? As we rush through these exploration licenses, as, been, as has been done by the government? Here's another one. Why does this bill provide for ministerial discretion to reduce absolute liability levels to below the legislative level of a billion dollars? Why are we doing this? And what are the implications of this provision? There has been a trend, in fairness, since the government came to power eight years ago, of vesting more and more power in ministers or, ca or the cabinet. Nowhere has that been, in my view, more egregious, Mr. Speaker, than in the case of decisions rendered by the impartial, arm's length, National Energy Board. Now, all of a sudden, as a result of the government's power grab, it's not good enough that a third party, outside of government, group of experts, quasi-judicial processes, expert evidence, a decision is rendered, and that's not good enough now, because if it's not in line with the government's views or their priorities, with a stroke of a pen, they can undermine the entire process. In fact, they can overrule the entire process. That's unusual, and it's been happening over and over and over again for eight years in different sectors. Here again, we see it slipped into the bill. I think the government has to explain to Canadians why that is. Why would the minister have the power to say, it's not a billion dollars, it's $220 million, or it's zero, or there's a delay in payment? So what are, what are the implications of this provision um, as we go forward, again, with another concentration of power in a single minister? We know that this bill is the culmination of many years, Mr. Speaker, of discussion, which objectively started under the previous Liberal government with respect to operator liability. And for that, I want to commend all those officials in the departments that have been involved in helping to craft this bill, who have helped lead those discussions, reconcile competing views. They should be congratulated for their hard work. We're only as good in this place, Mr. Speaker, as the work provided by those officials, and in many respects, we stand on their shoulders. So the second thing this bill does, we know, is it addresses recommendations to raise liability limits from the 2012 report of the Commissioner of Environment and Sustainable Development. I mean, I remind the House, another office created by the Liberal government. So Mr. Speaker, there are some very positive changes in this bill. We look forward to seeing it get to committee. We are looking forward to hearing from the experts on many important questions going forward. And I would say in closing, uh, this is a good, good building block in what I hope will become an adult conversation on Canada's energy future. Because in eight years, we have not had an adult conversation. <laughs> We've been fixating on a single pipeline, fixating on some other construction project, as opposed to saying, what does our energy future look like? What's the mix look like? To what extent are we integrated in North American context? Where are we going with greenhouse gases? 
I haven't heard the word uttered here today to talk about energy, which this bill addresses, without uh, talking about greenhouse gases, Mr. Speaker, in my view, is irresponsible. So in closing, I'm looking very much forward to seeing this bill in committee and uh, getting more inf information and more evidence to improve it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Questions and comments? Castelli, come on tide, the Honourable Minister of Natural Resources. No, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member for his intervention, um, the discipline and the rigour that he brings, not just to his presentation, but his questions in the past, and with particular uh, regards to some of the work that I've done with him, are very much appreciated. And I share uh, his concerns, uh, Mr. Speaker, about the broader uh, questions around energy and where, uh, in particular, uh, the nuclear sector fits in. I too have been concerned that the Green Pulp and Paper Transformation Program, for example, reduce the environmental footprint and significant costs of the pulp mill in Dryden from, went from 85 percent to 112 percent. And Rather unfortunately, the, pro, the priorities of the provincial government at that time, just a couple of years ago, didn't provide for that extra energy. Uh, at no cost to the environment and of great benefit to the high rate payers in northwestern Ontario could have gone on the grid line. That's a subject for another discussion. But it does raise a very important point when the member talks about the mix. And I appreciate um, the, the uh, consideration of things like water and nuclear medicine. Having just been the minister responsible for science and technology, I may be, uh, take some opposition to his sense that good research isn't being done in this area. But the concern I have is actually with the NDP, uh, fa NDP's failure to take a stand on the nuclear sector and secondly to understand uh, in the broader uh, context the important contributions it makes, in particular things like nuclear medicine and isotopes where we're making some great strides, for example, in Thunder Bay. So I wonder if this member could comment broadly and perhaps more specifically on his concern about the cost structure uh, under the scenario for liability that the NDP is proposing. And although he may have some exceptions with uh, and concerns around our liability regime, that it's taking us one more important step forward towards a reasonable balance between liability and rate pairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Ottawa South. Thanks, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to my colleague, the Minister, for the question. Uh, it's not within me, Mr. Speaker, to divine uh, with a divining rod, the, the uh, thinking of the NDP in this area. Um, I am not surprised. I'm not surprised that they're not in a position to talk about the implications of unlimited liability. Uh, it's interesting to call for that and have an aspirational goal. Uh, but we, as I used to say to my kids when they were very young, Mr. Speaker, tucking them into bed, you know, I would tell them about the way the world ought to be and then in the morning get up and deal with the way the world is. And I think the NDP do need to deal with the way the world is, although I do commend them for their aspirational views and unlimited liability. I'd like to hear from the experts of committee what the ramifications and the distributive effects of this will be. Now, going back to the energy mix that my colleague alluded to, I think it is fair to point out that in the last eight years, most, if not all, of the incentives that were in place, the fiscal incentives and the programmatic uh, expenditures that were helping us move to a greater renewable portfolio have all been eliminated. We've lost the renewable power production incentive. We've lost the wind power production incentive. We've eliminated the eco energy program for people's homes, Mr. Speaker. Trying to encourage the average citizen to retrofit where they live to make a contribution to energy efficiency. And this is unfortunate because I think where Canada should be going, Mr. Speaker, we can become, we can retool our economy and become the cleanest, most energy efficient most materials efficient and most water efficient economy in the world. So I think the minister ought to go back and take a look at some of those issues, some of those cuts, and perhaps look at reinstating them. Questions and comments? Kestjoni Kamantai, the Honourable Member for Halifax West. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank my Honourable colleague for his excellent presentation today. I also want to take the opportunity to congratulate the uh, 
the new minister on his, on his appointment. Looking forward to working with him. Uh, there are uh, a number uh, of issues uh, with this bill that I believe we have to study at the Natural, Natural Resources Committee, of which I'm the vice chair. And among those are, are for instance, the question of whether this, what, what impact this will have on the cost of operating for offshore energy companies off the Atlantic coast or in the Arctic. Uh, also, uh, in terms of the Arctic, my honorable colleague uh, from Ottawa South spoke very eloquently about the challenges there, and there is the question of whether or not a billion dollars is adequate uh, in the Arctic when, with the kinds of environmental concerns that a spill there could raise, the difficulties of, of spill response, especially uh, in deep water and especially under ice. Those are big concerns. Secondly, uh, the question of, of why the bill provides for ministerial discretion to reduce the liability, liability limit below a billion dollars. That's not clear to me, but I'd like uh, my, to ask my honourable colleague if he has any comments uh, on, on these issues. The Honourable Member for Ottawa South. Well, my first comment, Mr. Speaker, is uh, how uh, confident I am in my colleague from Halifax West, who will be sick handling uh, this debate at committee, who is going to be asking the very tough questions that he has just raised here on the floor of the House. And I'm very confident, and I think his constituents in the House should be very confident in the fact that he's going to be there that he's going to be making those contributions and eliciting that important evidence and testimony that we need to improve this bill. I would say going back though, Mr. Speaker, to a theme I, I picked up earlier, which I commend to my colleague from Halifax West. You know, so much of the last two years has been fixated, as I mentioned earlier, when it comes to energy, on a single pipeline, right? So when this pipeline issue, north-south, is resolved, everyone will feel either happy or unhappy about the outcome. But meanwhile, meanwhile, we're not having an adult conversation about energy in Canada. We're not having an adult conversation about energy in the United States. And we're not having an adult conversation about Canada's, United States and Mexico's integrated North American energy market, especially as Mexico now looks to inculcate private investment in its energy holdings, Mr. Speaker. That's a really important question for Canada's energy future. And instead of focusing on headline-grabbing comments around one particular pipeline, it's unfortunate this House has not been seized, as I have personally been calling for for eight years, and other voices have as well, that we have an adult conversation about what our energy future looks like, and to what extent can we use fiscal incentives and disincentives to improve our performance? How is this linked to our greenhouse gas reduction targets? I'm not having a conversation about that here, Mr. Speaker. Every time we do, the Prime Minister shuts it down, which, which I think is, frankly, irresponsible. So I'm really, really happy that my colleague from Halifax West will be stick-handling this through committee. I have every confidence he'll be raising these tough questions, Mr. Speaker. Questions and comments? Questions and commentaires? The Honourable Deputy de Compton the Honourable Member for Compton Stansted. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank my colleague from Ottawa Centre for his excellent speech. Uh, once in a, we, we, we thought that he would pick up his seat and wave it in the air, but in any case, uh, he raised an issue with regard to water management, and this is extremely important because water management, the oil industry and the gas industry use a lot of water, tons of water. And in Canada, our our laws, which should protect water, which is essential to life, to human life. Well, month after month, from the very start, the Conservatives are circumventing environmental protection rules and rules to protect water resources. If we want oil, the oil and nuclear sector to be uh, liable, well, they have to be called upon to protect water. Look at what happened in Japan. Uh, their water was contaminated and hundreds of thousands of people were contaminated as well. So what can my colleagues say about the importance of water management and how we, how we have to make oil and nuclear and gas companies more responsible when it comes to protecting our water? Merci, Monsieur le Président. Mon... Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My colleague is absolutely right. He's completely right because there's an issue here of, of accountability because water management plans should be mandatory and made even stronger in this economic sector. 
However, at the same time, Mr. Speaker, you cannot forget that there are unbelievable opportunities for Canada with regard to the future of water use and the use of drinking water throughout the world. Canada is very well placed. In fact, it is one of the countries with the most uh, water resources in the world. People turn to us as a country which manages its water well. We could do much better. But again, international opinion um, looks favorably on